say, come out and vote. And by the way, t- when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminists failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminists we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and we're on your smart speaker. Coming up, shockingly, a quarter of the UK's foreign aid budget is spent on housing asylum seekers and refugees. Plus, the rise of the suburban sick note. Every part of Britain has seen a rise in incapacity benefit claims for some of the largest increases in affluent commuter towns. And a teenage rally driver beats the odds and her disability with her sights set on Formula One. Daniela Sutton will be live in the studio. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. We've got a belter of a show for you tonight. We'll be discussing the former American football star and acquitted murderer, O.J. Simpson, who's died at the age of 76. Plus, Boris wades in on Sunak's smoking ban plan, calling it absolutely nuts. Meanwhile, uh, the UN's climate chief has warned there's only two years left to save the world. Brilliant. So, the only place to be on Earth right now is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Start your engines, put your pedal to the metal. Lights out, and away we go. Now, if you thought we spent too much time on foreign aid, uh, new revelations show that a quarter of the budget is not going on any actual worthy foreign developments, but has been used instead on the migrant hotel programme. This scandal, which has crippled the hospitality business for years now, uh, cost us alone about 4.3 billion pounds. And with total migration already higher at this point of the year since the boat started coming, it looks like the spending is only going to go up and up and up. I'd like to introduce my panel for tonight, journalist and broadcaster Sam Dowler, political commentator Reem Ibrahim, and barrister and broadcaster Andrew Eborn. <laughs> Such a ham, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I mean, I mean, how, did, how, did, how did he get his own theme tune? <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, he does a lot of talking behind the scenes, you know. I can't, <laughs> it's true. It's I true. can't help you. Anyway, listen, welcome to all of you. Uh, we've only got two years left, so just make the most of it, is my... Uh, well, we'll be explaining later why the UN's latest climate craze um, is now uh, being put into force. Apparently, despite the fact that we've reduced our climate emissions by 50%, it's not yes. enough. You know, so we're all going to die anyway. So I... there we are. But let's talk about this money business because, you know, the, the, the Rwanda word hasn't been mentioned yet. Nobody's gone there. Uh, we're now offering people three grand a time to go there if they'd like to go. <laughs> um, we're now spending millions and billions of pounds. People are being housed now permanently. We learned only yesterday, I think, that all the people who failed their asylum seeker uh, status don't ever go away anyway. They just stay here. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. And they're, sell- and they're selling off the apartments as well that we apparently that we apparently. Oh did. yes. And so, so I just read to Ella was like, oh well, that. Well, that's a shame. So yeah, I mean, like, it's like a giant pyramid scheme. Well, I mean, the, it is, and it's the, a get rich quick scheme. Exactly, yeah. and it's and, it, and it's mortifying. And and obviously, you know, the amount of money that you said, like the twenty five percent, like this is, this is this is money that they could have saved had they had the process in you know in mm. in place right. to deal with these immigrants yes. and, to, and to make and and to and to actually sort them out. But no, no, give them give put put, put them in a nice hotel. 25 percent right. of like our entire I mean the entire budget mm. is it, 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 it is crazy, and the scandal is they classified yeah. as overseas aid. When the reality yeah. is, it's what, 43, 4.3 billion, 28% of the total budget yes. is crazy. The other side of the thing, there's a brilliant film at the moment called Il Capitan, or Il Capitano, which shows <laughs> actually the, the, the migrant side of it, which is the horrendous torture, the who's murder, the blackmail. Oh, wow. I've seen it, I've seen the thing. Well, and it good. shows their yeah, but who's made it? Over. Who, yeah. Who's made the film? Um, I'm not sure, but it was, it's, it's up for all sorts of awards. Go right. and have a look at it. What I would say, the people we need to, to deal with are the people traffickers. That's the abhorrent trade in all this. They're the criminals, and they're, you know, obviously they're the ones that we've got to compete against, right? Effectively, right. we need to have those safe and legal routes in order to compete with them. But actually what's really interesting about this, and you mentioned this, Sam, is the Home Office failures. Yeah. 
Home Office waiting list for asylum seekers went from 100,000 to 170,000. Mm. The real number is probably more than that, yeah. but that was the figure as of summer last year. And we've got to have these conversations about why these policies aren't working. Now, I'm personally not very pro-Rwanda policy. I think it's a bit of a waste of money. Mm. We're giving money to a foreign a bit government. bit of a waste of money. Well, a huge amount of waste of money. We were spending huge amounts of money and then saying, actually, if you voluntarily come, you get three grand. I mean, it is really ridiculous. Yeah. But we saw this week with the ECHR's uh, uh, commitment to this this new ruling with the UN, we're talking about this, where effectively that actually this lawyer came in and said that those women in, in Swiss 70-year-olds were um, were able to then get that money back and actually say that they were they had their human rights uh, uh, violated. I think silly things like that mean that there is a potential for us to leave the ECHR. Sunak the has said that surely, we might do. The problem surely now is that the people who are here need to be put mm. somewhere yeah. and somebody has to pay for that. And whether we pay for their houses or yeah. whether we pay for their... Um, you know, uh, asylum seeking. I think well, there's I 34 think we million. Hang on. I think I there's. Think... Well, I think that might be the answer. But, but the, money but the is... problem is at the moment, we have to, you know, they're here already. I'm not yeah. so concerned about the people who are not here yet. Mm. I'm more yeah. concerned about the ones who are here. But the money is going on the illegal on the illegal immigrants. That's that's the point. It's not yeah. which is a tiny which is a tiny percentage of net migration to this yeah, country. But a several tiny billion percentage. pounds. So, so, a... tell, so tell me why they haven't in all this time, they haven't managed to get enough people to process. They haven't managed to like they keep talking about all oh, the gangs, the gangs, but where is where is the progress? Where is where is yeah. where is anything? Tell, tell us something good. They, yeah. just, they just stand there going, oh Rwanda, that's the answer. No, but that's clearly, isn't it? Yeah, and not think, one person think... has gone to Rwanda. No, but, but, no, but yeah. hang on. The problem is not necessarily with the government here. The problem is with the civil service because they clearly at the Home Office do not want to process anybody. Because no. if they wanted to do stuff, they could have done it. There's plenty of people working there. They're just not doing anything. And what does it take them one week to process one person? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, but if the, gov but if the government wants, the, if the government wanted them to do it quicker, then they could have. No, they, they could. No, they've tried. Look at all the Look at all. Hang on. Look at all the different Home Secretaries that have come in and you know, Sarah Bravman was the one who said. She knows the Home Office better than anybody. She was a lawyer in the Home Office. She'll make it work. She couldn't make it work. Pretty Patel couldn't make it so work. Is it, is it that can't civil servants themselves are against the government? I think that's part policy. of it. Yeah. yeah, I think that's part of it. And I think it's, they it's don't want to do the waste. job. You're, you're and they know right. very well that if they don't bother yeah. um, actually processing the stay. cases, they'll just stay anyway. Do you think we, they're, we they're putting their feet up? Or yeah. They're putting their feet up in the offices and they're not in the office. They're all at home. 90% of the work. Well, that's what they say. The Home Office spend, which rose by 559 million in 2020. That's the crazy thing. Rwanda, Rwanda's a distraction. They can only process 200 people. So yeah. it's nonsense. You look at the figures that they have on sort of that sort yeah, of side. Yeah, forget about Rwanda. I'm going to ban the crazy. word. Exactly. We're not saying it anymore. Because Rwanda's not the story. Yeah. The story yeah. is the people that are here yeah. who are going absolutely nowhere, yeah. except they're now being moved out of hotels yes. into housing, which is being purchased by the government. And they're not allowed and to which work. which is being given to them I, for free. I, I think there's a real scandal about the story. What would you give them people, to do, though? I, a lot of them have tried to work illegally as... But a lot of them in, do. In, in the, in the gig economy, or maybe and they, I think or maybe that's they absolutely could, fine. Or maybe they could use their own skills. I mean, we can't we can't say that. Oh, they're they're only good for cleaners, or they're no, only no, good no, for doing this. this. Like point, a lot of them have, will have their own skills. It is currently but, illegal for those people on asylum. They're, they're effectively in limbo. They're not yeah, allowed to work. Yeah. Their asylum seeker application hasn't been processed. Yeah. I would say it's much better for those individuals to be allowed to, to be given the right to work. I have no issue with an asylum seeker on a waiting list delivering my takeaways. To be completely honest. Well, you got, I I guess what? Fine. They already are. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Everyone who turns up. That's the point. I mean, remember they rounded up 20 uh, delivery drivers down in Brighton yeah. a, a few well, months ago and they were all illegal. And, and, and that's the problem. And, and, but you need to keep track of these things and yeah. also put the figures in perspective. They're talking about the Home Office spent eight million a day last year. Mm. Yes, eight million a day, absolutely crazy. Right. There's a safety in certain things about giving people jobs. You do need a, a sort of net migration and so on and so forth to make sure certain jobs like care and so on and so forth are filled. Yeah. But we need to deal with this. The, the, the number is down though, what they're saying is the number is down by more than 56,000 at the end of September at the Department of Defense. So there is some sort of progress. What we need to no, do though, the, the, the main sort of problem is down that, though. The number of what? Well, the, what they're saying is the number, this is basically the, there are 20,000 fewer people staying in the accommodation than six months ago. So, so this where is have they gone? Thing. But well, the that's the question. The number of people on the waiting well, list I mean, You know, they've just gone to some more accommodation. The, well, they're, they're, trying, they're, yeah. trying to put up, they're trying to put up these temporary houses. So I was down, as you know, I was down in Cannes where they were talking about these temporary I houses. I get that in somewhere. I'm going to do with that. I'm probably on a holiday. It's going to be good. Actually, actually, a proper question for you. Yes. Was, how was Cannes? Because, you know, the south of France is an area which is an area immigrant problem. Absolutely. And what did you see? One of the things there was a Japanese company there which would talk about actually during earthquakes and things like that they set, uh, set up temporary accommodation yeah. which is a fraction of the cost. But are they doing that in France? So, so that's what they're looking at. It's not down in Cannes. No. Surprise, surprise. They don't want to ruin the, uh, the, the aesthetics. There's, there's a difference things. between the south of France and the south of England. You can live in a tent in Cannes but you cannot live in a 
can a tent but, in but the reality is these hotels the reality <laughs> the these hotels are different. far too expensive so they're, they're putting up yeah. temporary but accommodation also, again the whole system has been ruined from point one to, to point ten because yes. i mean the one i know about north Eye, which is down in bexhill is a former um, army camp right yes uh, it was taken over by emirates airlines for a while uses a training base for their for their uh, flight staff They've now bought it, right? They're releasing it in order to give it, uh, give put put something like a thousand migrants in it, right? But they bought it from the people that they're releasing it from. The people leased who who, who sold it to them bought it for seven million, sold it to the Home Office for fifteen million. Yeah, it's so crazy. they're paying through the nose for this place. It's not ready. They'll have to spend another the, five or six million on it it's, it's before all, it's ready. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's, it's, almost so it's almost the same as the. It's almost the same as the pandemic. Do you mean Rishi Sunak's, you know, money tree? It's like yeah. people are making Just money, throw money from, at it. People are making money from this, from selling this, from yeah. from, from rents, but from rents. Another anything. government failure. Sure. And also, let's remember this: this is taxpayer money. It's our hard-earned yeah. money, and we currently we have almost the highest tax burden since the Second World War. We are paying through the nose in taxes. Yeah. Where are we seeing it in public services? Where are we seeing it in government spending that is actually impacting real people? Yeah. And when we're looking at the way in which asylum seekers have been treated, where they are forced to be reliant on other taxpayers. Yeah. No wonder why people resent them. And, and we should also look at the promises that were made. So Robert Jenrick, the former immigration officer, he said in October that they would be exiting 50 hotels by the end of January. Well, yeah. let's see if that happens. Well, but, that has, but James that has, Cleverly said <laughs> last Wednesday the process will continue until the last hotel is closed. So these are the promises. We need to continue to hold their feet yeah, to the fire. Yeah, but that doesn't help anyone delivered. because all it means is that they then move these people into communities who don't want That's them. That's what you need to do. Which and causes friction, causes difficulty. Yeah. And as as Reem says, if they're not working anywhere, yeah. exactly what are they doing yeah. all day? They can't, around. they can't process them quicker, quicker enough that more people come from behind. Well, and exactly. it just and the and numbers just grow. It's always the problem with the media because you're only ever reporting one side of it. So it's all about the numbers. But no, we do all solutions. sides of it here, Andrew. We do. That? Yeah, we do all sides of it here. We, we, we do, thing. absolutely. The other absolutely. thing, of course, is this week was the week that the European Parliament decided to have a sort of EU-wide agreement, yes. which is still not really very sort of sure about how it's going to how it's going to work out. But they're talking about getting better plans to move, move yeah. people back to their country of origin as soon as they hit Europe, which yes. would be a big help. Because, mm. I mean, let's face it, it's a big European problem. Oh, it's absolutely. And, yeah. and you need collaboration right. absolutely to make but that work. But if they got deported as soon as they got to Italy yes. or as soon as they got to Spain or Greece, that would yeah. be a, a beginning. Mm. That yeah. would be a it, huge difference. It, it's totally that sort of, And this is going back to the solution, which you're brilliant at doing on this show. It's I am. And it's Thank always, <laughs> always been that sort of, It is looking at all sides. But the reality is that's some of the solutions. You turn around and say, make, make sure it's not attractive right. to come here. Right. Make sure you target the people trying Africa's well, you know how you do that? Side. You know how you do that? You stop giving people free stuff. I'm yes. sorry, but the fact of the matter is the welfare state in this country is incredibly generous for people that are, let's be honest, just lazy. Yeah. And we've got almost 5.3 million people in out-of-work benefits in the United yeah. Kingdom. And a lot of those people, we saw the story today, that was, I think it was front page of the Times, that actually a lot of these people are claiming mental health sickness. Yeah. Many of those people are probably genuinely too sick to work. I believe many of those people no, but they, are. Can I just say, they, they, work, they, they work the system. I know people well, work yeah. in that system. Of course, and they, and they are, and they, and they yeah. do, and they we'll do come back to this down. because yeah. we're, running, we're running over. Yeah. Remember you mentioned the five um, Bulgarian, you know, um, guys who managed to rip £50 million pounds off of us before Absolutely. anybody noticed. Yeah. Amazing. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up next, Rishi is smoked out by Boris Johnson over his tobacco ban and Britain's big on benefits as nationwide people take up payments. Stay there. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kingdom City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking <laughs> and screaming. I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Oh, it's carry on. What just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement. If you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Boris Johnson has described Rishi Sunak's policies as absolutely nuts in a scathing attack on the Prime Minister. The former leader slammed plans to ban the sale of cigarettes to younger generations and called for an increase in defence spending as he addressed the Conservative conference in Ottawa. Mr Johnson also criticised the state of the Conservative Party, suggesting it lacked the dynamism of its Canadian counterpart. Joining me now to discuss all of this, Mike Indian, political analyst, Paul Burke, author of The Spectator, and Rafe heidel Menku, historian and broadcaster. Good evening, gentlemen. Very nice to see you. Um, I'm not quite sure what the connection is between smoking and defence, but I mean, I'm sure <laughs> Boris can explain it to somebody. Um, the smoking thing is stupid, so I suppose we might as well dispense with that pretty quickly. The idea that you're going to not be able to sell cigarettes to somebody who's 40, uh, in the future, but you can sell them to his 41-year-old mate. So this is based and you're on... going to ask him how how close to 40 well, years. It's, it's the New Zealand law, basically, where they increase the age of... The but they've dumped it. A year as well. They're and not even doing it. I, I mean, it's... Rishi Sunak had the bold idea and now he's junked it, but... I mean, look at this 3% on defence spending, for example. Boris Johnson was Prime Minister for nearly three years. He didn't get anywhere near this level now. He's harping from the sidelines, carping on about what he thinks they should have done in government. Now he's out of power and he's missing a taste of what he had, yeah. to be honest. I but, I mean, like a lot of these people, and Liz Truss was, was, was here a little bit earlier being interviewed, you know, they like to go to the North American sort of plantagenet part of the world, don't they? <laughs> yeah. and, and talk about proper conservatism and why they've lost track of it all. Mm. Don't they? I think they do, uh, because... I mean, I think Boris was unlucky. Boris, like he's my mate, uh, was unlucky with COVID. I think yeah. all Western regions were. So yeah. the, a lot of what they may have spent went on that. But the smoking thing, we, we're giving up smoking anyway as a yeah. nation. Yeah. We, we did it quite voluntarily, you know, with, with, with a lot of nudging. Yeah. But it's amazing how... It's now more unusual like... to see people yeah, smoking, it is. actually, isn't it? Yeah. Very well, as you know, as, as, as someone who used to live in Ottawa, let me give you... I'm a big cigar smoker, <laughs> right? I, I'm also on the board of the Churchill Society. So yes. I, so look, I, I support... Now, where this. can you smoke that cigar in London? So, well, I supported Boris when he refused to ban smoking in parks and public squares, which is one of the few places you can do that, mm. apart yes. from in, in club gardens and so forth. But actually, this is the first time I'll say this, I support Richie Sunak on this policy. Right. Because nobody who smokes today is going to actually ever uh, be affected by this policy. And uh, if, you know, if you smoke today, you'll smoke to the day you die. Mm. But I don't think there's a single parent in this country who would want their child to start smoking. And that's what this policy it, it affects. And I, in fact, the majority of cigarette smokers in this country wish that they had never started and want to quit. But that's always been the case. And I think mm. I'm afraid the problem is, is that, you know, I, I think I had my first drink when I was about 11, mm. you know, because my mother used to smoke, you know. Uh, my kids now don't have parents who smoke. But... Kids will find ways of doing things. You know, it might as well say you're not allowed to smoke marijuana. They're not allowed to take drugs. They're not allowed to have a drink before they're over the age of 18. They do all of it. 
and 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 they sort of don't because it looks so weird. You see old programs like the Sweeney and this yeah. like <laughs> yeah. Parkinson. It just looks really weird. Yeah, but well, we still make it look cool though, don't yeah. we? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think we. I, I think my, we can make my it only cool. concern is I don't want it to affect premium tobaccos, so pipes and cigars. <laughs> yeah. that's a very different experience I mean, than having. Yeah, but can you answer that question? Like where yeah. in London can you smoke your cigar? I mean, apart well, from outside. If you go to private members' clubs, you can still smoke. Right. You, you can actually smoke in cigar shops because Five if you're, if you're purchasing you a cigar, smoke, you? you're actually having, you're actually, you, you can, you're allowed to sample it. So you can yeah. sample cigars. But yes, I, I used right. to smoke a lot. I, I actually filmed a promo for this show, which I think they may be able to show you. There's a cigar in my mouth there. Um, but the promo for the, for the show, they wanted me to light a cigar with some uh, with some money, which was actually my money, <laughs> and. Um, I said, well, I might as well smoke it properly. And it was horrible. I, it was absolutely I used to disgusting. forget that I didn't like cigars. It was ghastly. Like, so, so you, yeah. You'd be somewhere years ago and, and one a camera. Oh, yeah, and I have thought, some of I forgot, I hate these. Yes, they're awful. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the times I tried no, to no, no, smoke no, it, no, 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 I tried no. to smoke those little thin cigars, you know, it was in and place I was working at Fleet Street. Yeah. And we went to the pub at lunchtime, as you did, and I ended up smoking all six of them um, <laughs> in the space of about two hours drinking. And it was awful, absolutely horrendous. We'll, and we'll, go for a drink, we'll go for a drink one day, and right. we can smoke inside a couple of places I know, and then we'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. I'm what, just, I what just, you think. I mean, my, my, I think my lungs have also sort of changed because mm. if I try to smoke anything, I can't. It's like I can't. I couldn't even hold the smoke in. You know, I smoked for probably I don't know, 35 years. It's like Angel Delight, isn't it? You couldn't eat that now either. No, just my, no, my, absolutely not. not to Angel Delight. No. Let's talk about benefits, Britain, because uh, we're now saying that every constituency in the country now has got a rise in the numbers of people claiming benefits and higher in some of the places where you might consider them to be sort of slightly better off commuter towns, for example. Now, I wonder if a lot of this is related to the working from home brigade and the whole COVID situation where people stopped thinking they had to go to work. Well, specifically, it's about the increase in capacity benefit. And this reflects the fact we've had a record rise in the number of people that are to use that horrible phrase, economically inactive due to poor health. And yeah. we look at the increase, it's happening for the over 50s, but also the under 25s as yeah. well, due, especially due to poor mental health. And actually, I was in Coventry earlier, and that's seen the sharpest rise by percentage in this as well. But also we're seeing it in Tory commuter towns too. Britain is facing a sickness epidemic here, mm. and it's partly because of the fact that we were told during lockdown to stay inside, protect the NHS, but we weren't told to protect ourselves. Right. And actually, our health as a nation has suffered as a result of this, and we're still reaping the dividends years later as a result. Is that an NHS problem, though, more than it is a... I can never understand that. that, um, Protect the NHS. Sorry, isn't it the other way round? Yes. When they set up to protect us. I'd ask the question, um, how many of these people, (laughs) I don't know what I'm going to say, but are in the public sector? Yeah. Because I think, in fact, I know uh, they get... It's a lot easier to get time off in the public sector. Oh, my God, yeah. But it's yeah. also quite easy to get time off in the, in no, the private sure. sector. I mean, I know people who, during COVID, hired people to come into work, but they never actually came into the office. Mm. And they now no longer work because they were asked to come into the office. You're going so to any coffee shop companies. on a Friday or, or a Monday. Yeah. Absolutely mobbed. Well, funnily well, enough, my yeah. son's up uh, visiting yeah. me today from, from Sussex, and we were just walking around London Bridge, and it's so busy on a Thursday, Thursday night. Because yeah. Thursday night is the new Friday. Is, yeah. Every yeah. pub is rammed. There's people all over the streets. Mm. There's people having a great time. The weather's nice and warm. I said, tomorrow, there'll be none of this. And it's really weird now in mm. London, where Fridays and Mondays, the nightlife is just dead. But this is all happening at the same time when it's never been easier to work from home. And yet there are, mm. you know, if, if we went back to pre-pandemic levels, there would be a million fewer people on benefits and sick in this country. Mm. And yes, a lot of it is, is genuine, but also I think we've diluted the meaning of mental health. And I think many people who are simply not in the best of moods are claiming mm. mental health yeah. benefits. And two thirds of claimants don't actually need to find a job. I mean, that's, I think sorry, that's, that's a subjective judgment it's not though, a sub- based it's, on it's the. Not, it's not subjective. No, 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 it, it is. I'm all. sorry. No, well, there are, hang on, there are 6 million people who are economically inactive. Now, you're not going to tell me that some well, no, of them. There's 2.7 million people that are economically mental inactive. Health, in this country, mental health. Up from 2.1 million about pre pandemic. Well, there's 6 million people who are classified by the National Audit Office as economically inactive. Yes, but one of the issues that we do face as a country is that, unfortunately, people's health habits have changed. I mean, look, it's easy to work from home if you're in a white-collar job, but unfortunately, one of the things we have had is a lot of people now that say work in service industries come into work, but they haven't been able to find jobs, because, you know, particularly in central London, for example. London's mobbed. I don't see it busier. People are coming into fr- work when Mondays, they feel like it. Yeah, because they're, they're working they're from, from home. Exactly. Not but, they're not, but not working. Not, but it's not mobbed every day of the week. This is the reason that Sadiq Khan's just cut the cheap fares on in the capital on Friday. But you're also ignoring the fact that it's the youth of today who are have the most evidence of mental health sickness, which is a complete contrast. Actually, it's 20... men in their 30s no, that have the not. most evidence it's, it's about it. 
checked this before I came out. Is it evidence or is it just and the, and the problem is, of course, is that we have, we have coddled children for so long. You know, we have single, we have one child families where kids are actually pampered to far too much. They have unrealistic expectations about the work, work life. They go to the work world, they're not prepared for that, they can't do the work, they're not getting the rewards and the lifestyle that they're expecting to get. Added to that, we've now seen a, a doubling in depression because of things like social media and smartphones and so forth. And of course, you know, I've said in the past, Swedish kids are the most privileged in the world, and yet they were the ones who reported the highest level yeah. of depression. Why? Because they're always being asked about their mental health. Mm. How do you rank yourself on a grade right. of one to 10? If people are constantly obsessing about mental health, they're going to report higher levels of yes. mental health, and they're going to miss the having a the bad day. Isn't helping them because the government has just passed yet another law for employers, for employers who say that as soon as you f start your first day on the job, you're entitled to ask no, for flexible right, it's working. It's the right to request flexible well, working. Well, it's, it's not the one. right thing to do because the problem is is that we have an economy which is dying on its ass, right? And the reason it's dying on its ass is there's no growth. Nobody's doing anything which is creating any growth. People are looking for excuses not to problem. work. This People want a work-life balance now. When I was going into work first, you went into work because you wanted to make money, you wanted to make something of yourself. Now people go into work in order to have a nice work-life balance. It's a different mentality. I don't know why they don't um, force them, but, but mandate that. Mm. Because um, so, more, say, more offices are asking yeah. people to return to work. No, not asking, Civil service has gone to three days a week. Yeah, but it shouldn't well. be a choice, though. No, that's you, my point. Well, it's not well, required. No, if you're a civil servant, sometimes you have to be in office three days a week now. I think oh, my no, God. The, 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 the civil they're servants they're should be right, in they? the office five days a week. No excuses. They work for us. The country relies right. on them. And considering no. the state yeah. of most of the, 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 the departments of state, if you like, you know, the Home Office has got a massive backlog of asylum seekers, right? For example, they say it takes them a week to, to process one of them. Now, if they rule it work five days a week in an office, maybe it would speed up a bit. I'd be a little more you know? sympathetic to the government if they hadn't sold off all the office space in central London. But they haven't. Accommodate the Home Office is sitting there completely empty. They haven't oh, sold no, there, it off. There is, there is capacity to bring them back in. To bring it well, back so, to Well, you just said they'd sold it all off. You well, can't they have, have sold a lot ways. of the office space off. If every civil servant that was based fetching in central London came in, they can't house them. They have to do hot desking. But if, that's, if you, that's if just you work another freelance, excuse. Freelance, it's particularly galling because as a freelancer, you can... Work where you, you like. Get work sick a lot less than yeah, you're freelance. Yeah, 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 doctor, I've found. Doctor freelance. Yeah, yeah, cool. But we put up with all sorts of things. Um, yeah, we, we've got freedom, but we've got no pension, no work, yeah. no. Th right. And these people want all our benefits. They, yeah. want to, they will go and work in coffee shops and work life balance, but they still want the regular salary. Yeah. The the pension. And they make me sick. Yeah. Well, exactly right. Not, not literally. Because sick. those people, <laughs> because those people, the yeah. of the those people who actually do work hard yeah. for a living because they want to make something of themselves, because they want to make more yeah. money, um, are not likely to want to take a duvet day. They want no. to. They want to go into work. But they, 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 they won't want to go into work so much. I wouldn't if I knew the office was empty on a right. Friday. Right. So it's a. They've got to mandate it. Mm. I'm an introvert, so yeah. personally, I would love to go into the <laughs> office on a Friday. But people no. are always asking, why do we have a productivity? crisis in this country yeah. and this is one of the reasons again amongst amongst there's nobody's doing under anything under 34, that's why yeah. one one day out of five they've said that they tend to work less and be less productive on that you know right. and in terms of benefits by the end of the decade we're going to be spending 25 billion pounds more on sickness benefits so yeah. this affects all of us and that absolutely does we'll have much more to say about this i'm sure later on you're watching the independent republic of mike graham coming up after the break i'll speak to a teen race car driver who's beat all the odds and is on track to be the first female formula one driver you won't want to miss it. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
they might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, listen. <laughs> there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. And now, my next guest has had a rather impressive rise in the world of racing, winning several awards and finishing fourth in the prestigious Daniel Ricciardo series. And the teenage karting champion is only 15, but she's got her eyes on the prize, eventually hoping to secure a seat in the upper echelons of motorsport racing. I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by teenage karting champion Daniela Sutton and her biggest supporter and stepmother, Rachel. Welcome <laughs> to both of you. Thank you very much for joining us. Great to see you. Um, you're down here in this part of the world because you're from Warrington up north. Um, I can tell the story, I suppose. I, yeah. I don't know if I should tell the story. How <laughs> I know you guys. Um, it goes all the way back to my early days when I used to do a show at Talk Sport. Um, it was the overnight show and your dad, who's called Dan, used to ring in. And because of the old way that we used to do phone-in radio, everybody was kind of known with their first name and where they came from. And it was always Dan from Warrington. So I knew him as Dan from Warrington. And he used to ring in every night, practically, and we'd have great conversations. He was driving, I think, for a living yeah. in those days. He, he probably does. still does, yeah. yeah. Um, and he made an awful lot of sense. And, you know, we sort of hit it off. And I've never met him. But I've now suddenly met his daughter <laughs> uh, because he got in touch with me and said, you know, my daughter's done this incredible thing. She's got herself into um, race car driving, rally car driving. And um, she's brilliant. She's, she's, she's got a sponsor, but she's always looking for more sponsors. That's Dan uh, in the picture there. Um, so tell us, first <laughs> of all, Daniela, how on earth you got into this business that we were in. So I was six years old when my dad took me indoor karting in Manchester. And then it was only a hobby up until about uh, when I was around 11, when I got my Motorsport UK karting license. Right. Um, and then I raced in the Daniel Ricciardo series, backed by F1 driver Daniel Ricciardo right. um, for a few years. And then last year, I came fourth in the championship out of 32 right. plus drivers, wow. um, which was quite an achievement as well as... In 2022, I was Total Karting Zero UK North Champion, right. which is a karting series which is electric, backed by um, XF1 engineer okay. Rob Smedley. Yeah. Um, so that was quite exciting quite, as well. Quite exciting. <laughs> and it's a proper kart, isn't it? This is like when you read about Lewis Hamilton and how he started. He was a yeah. karting champion, and they, that's how you kind of begin. But they're pretty quick, aren't they? How fast do they go? Um, Around 70 or 80 miles per hour. Wow. Yeah. Right. That's that. I mean, I, I'm, I take my kids karting occasionally, and I'm not very good at it, and, and some of them are actually better than I am. But so what made you do it, though? What was, what was the kind of... What, did you just fancy it? Did you, did you enjoy the speed? What is it? So I actually played rugby when I was around nine years old. Right. Um, with an, on an all-boys team as well. Right. Um, which was quite rough. I bet. <laughs> and then, um, I said to my dad, can I go back to karting, please? Right. And he just let me so go. So you're going to smashed into it. every weekend, yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, and, and you're racing against other girls and boys, or how does it work? 
Um, it's mixed mm. um, at this stage. Right. And hopefully F1 will soon be mixed and there will be female Formula 1 yeah. drivers. And I aspire to be one of those. Yes. So. Well, there's no reason why not. I mean, you know, because I mean, it's, a, it's quite a physical job driving, isn't it? I mean, it's, 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 it's more demanding, I suppose, than most people would know. But there's no reason why a woman couldn't do it as well as a man. Is there? Um, well, we have to work harder, certainly, mm. but just as people have to work to get into the army, right. um, we might have to work two times harder, right. but that doesn't mean we can't get up there. Yes. Um, and so if you're in an average race, is it, what, is it about 50-50 women and, 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 and boys? Um, no, I'd say it's more like 70-30, 80-20. Right. So more boys and girls, right. And that doesn't bother you? No, not no? at all. <laughs> we all see each other as competitors and right. racers rather than by our gender. Yeah. And this weekend you're going down to Brands Hatch, which of course is, you know, the iconic track. What sort of car are you going to be driving? Um, I'm going to be driving a Fiesta Mark 7 right. um, with Pro Alloys Racing, my team, and I actually won the scholarship, the BRSCC Fiesta Junior Scholarship uh -huh. to race in that this year. And without that, that definitely wouldn't be possible. It's such an amazing prize to win. Right. And how did you win that? And there's some pictures. As, as we're talking, we're looking at pictures of you. <laughs> I mean, it's such, I'm so proud of you. I don't, I don't even know you really, but I just think it's a brilliant <laughs> thing that you're doing. And so when you're racing around Brands Hatch, how fast are you going? Same? Um, probably around 120 at points. Mars Prowler. 120? <laughs> Mars Prowler, yeah. See, yeah, I mean, I've driven at 120, but, but it's very frightening. It's very frightening. You're not meant to. I know. <laughs> I know. There's I a stretch of road uh, just as you get over the border in Scotland. Um, They'll be waiting for you now. They will be now, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's, very, it's always very, very quiet. And Rachel, do, do you find yourself sort of in the biting your nails when she's racing? No, or? I love it. I yeah. get so excited. I get really giddy. I'm just like, look at it go, look at it go. It's it's your dad, isn't it, that gets yeah. kind of nervous. Like, right. oh my gosh, look at it. Right. But yeah, she's she's just such full of determination, aren't you? And it's what you've always wanted right. to do. And then when we got to this year, deciding on the next step, and realised we couldn't fund the step to cars. Yes. Because um, I was going to ask, is it expensive to do then? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the scholarship that Danielle has won covers £65,000 worth of prize, right. which gives the race weekends, um, the Friday practice, right. but no damage, no extra test days. Right. So if you think of damaging your normal road car, yeah. it's that plus probably more. Right. And then. And is it, is it your car or do you just kind of borrow the car? Or? We kind of borrow it from the team. Right. Um, but if you smash it up, obviously, that's, yes, that's a problem. So yeah. I've signed something, sadly. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, this is the thing. And have you ever been in a crash, a bad crash? Um, not in cars. In carton, there's been a few. <laughs> there is with all racing, right. but right. Um, it's bound to happen. We're racing machines right. at the end of the right. day. Right, you are, and they're very quick. Now, you haven't got a driving licence, right? No, I haven't. And is that because you're not allowed to have one at your age? Yes. That's you ridiculous, do, isn't it? You do have a racing driver's license. Yes. Though. Yeah, I'm, well, you're not racing elite. No, I didn't mean that. <laughs> but, you, but you couldn't actually get in a car and drive it. No. Amazing. And of course, the one thing that people don't know, and they wouldn't know looking at you or listening to you now, right now, is that you've also got a sort of um, a, a, a problem, a condition that, 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 that makes it quite painful for you to race. Tell us about that. Um, so I have juvenile idiopathic arthritis, mm. which is a hidden disability. It's um, an immune like disorder. Right. Um, so I inject myself with an... some pictures of you just, I think, <laughs> being treated oh, yeah. with an immune suppressant medication right. um, every other week um, called adalimumab. And it's managed with that. It's not curable. Um, I am in pain at race weekends sometimes, but then we take anti-inflammatories such as naproxen or mm. ibuprofen or paracetamol to help right. with pain. Um, so I manage it, yes. Um, and I want to most find my racing as kind of that thing to keep me going mm. because if I didn't have my racing, I don't think I'd be able to push through the pain. Right. It's kind of my my aim to get better, and it's my goal yes. to get better for. And and would, and does it affect your racing if you if you are in pain? I'd say <laughs> no, not usually, because the adrenaline takes away all the pain. The adrenaline of as I said, going 120 miles per hour right. um, around a racetrack takes right. away a lot of the pain. I guess so. Is it fright? I mean, do you are you frightened? I mean, it's exhilarating, I guess. But are you are you are you sort of frightened of, of losing oh. control of the car? No, I wouldn't say I'm frightened. I don't um, think you can be frightened, can you? If you're frightened, then it's probably not. But I think a lot. I mean, you know, because of course I used to work at Talksport. I used to talk to a lot of sporting sort of professionals, and and they almost stood out for me because they they were exactly like that. They found. Mm -hmm 
whatever the sport was that they did to be something that they they found helpful to them as opposed they, you know they never approached it in fear you know footballers would say you know I, my, my problems were when I came off the pitch not when I went on yeah. there, you know and and so you seem to have that kind of winning mentality which is what you need right yeah hopefully <laughs> and you're also doing GCSEs I understand um yes I'm in year 10 right now yeah. and I'm doing my GCSEs in the next year so how do you fit all that in <laughs> and, and I mean what do the people at school think of you um people at school don't actually aren't quite too bothered about no. my racing um it's a it's, pretty unusual thing to be doing mm. at 15 isn't it um yes I suppose but I think a lot of them don't understand like quite what it is um yeah. So when you try and explain them, it to them, they don't quite believe it sometimes right. as well. Um, but to balance my education and my racing as well, when I'm not in school because of my racing, I do my work at home. I right. ask the teachers for work. Yeah. Um, I ask my school for the work and we always let the school know. And the school are quite proud of what I'm doing. Yeah, they should I got be. a head teacher's award for doing my racing Brilliant. outside as well, right. Quite good. And you talk about wanting to be in Formula One. I mean, who do you like currently in Formula One? Who's 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 you're going to probably be sharing. So sort of, I saw an interview with you and you were sharing sort of pit lane with with people from Formula One who had been to that very same place. Yeah. So um, I think all the Formula One drivers now, every single Formula One driver is inspirational mm. in their own ways. They all have different driving techniques. They all have different personalities. Obviously, Daniel Ricciardo has to be one of my idols almost yeah. because I raced in his karting series, right. um, as well as drivers, past drivers such as Michael Schumacher yeah. and Ayrton Senna, who are yes. honestly inspirational in many ways. There he is. Yeah, have you seen the movie Senna? It's absolutely yeah. incredible. Yes, I have. Such yeah. a good film. Very emotional. Yeah, it really is. And it's a, it's a real tribute, I think, to, to, to Rachel and, and, and to um, your dad, Dan. That they've let you sort of develop this in a way. I mean, I don't want to give them too much credit, but <laughs> I mean, it must it, it, it must be, you know, nice to have that sort of support as well. Um, yeah, they I, they sacrifice a lot for me, and I'm really grateful for that. Like, yeah. they're my number one supporters, uh -huh. and I think they always will be. And my dad actually gets very nervous watching me, which right. I quite, find quite amusing myself. Yes. <laughs> um, right. So so you're going to go to Brands Hatch probably tonight. You're going to practice tomorrow. Presumably? Um, yes. So and on Friday, it's practice. So I have four practice sessions. Yeah. And then on the Saturday, I have quali and race one, qualifying and race one. Yeah. And then on Sunday, I have two races. Okay. And you hope to win them? Do you think you've got a chance of winning them? Well, always. We're always aiming for top. We're yeah. always aiming for P1. If we're not aiming for pole, then... And do you have sort of rivals that you meet at some of these meetings <laughs> that you recognise and go, I'm going to beat you today? <laughs> I think we all joke about it sometimes, um, saying, oh, yeah, I'm well quicker than you, or, yeah. <laughs> like, just joking around. Right. But, um, and you get to blame the car, like Lewis Hamilton does, when he goes, oh, I've got a rubbish car now, that's why I can't win it anymore. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't say that, no. Well, I'm not saying you should say that, but, I mean, just in case you don't win, you don't want to blame the car. No, you always criticise yourself, um, because there's always yeah. a lot to take out of yourself and improve yes. on, always. You can right. always find... Um, something to improve on. Of course. Well, it's brilliant to meet you and good luck on the weekend. What happens after that? And if you are going to pass, make a pathway to Formula One, what's next? Um, so, obviously, the, um, the Fiesta Junior Championship is an amazing series, close-knit mm. racing. Um, next, I would hope to get um, scouted possibly for the F1 Academy, right. which is a series designed for females trying to get the first female Formula One driver. Okay. Um, so I suppose that will be the next avenue. Um, and yeah, it would just be amazing to race in yes. well, anything good luck as with a it. career, really. I'd be, I mean, I'm going to start following your career now because it's going <laughs> to be something to watch. It's brilliant to meet you. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming in. Good nice luck at the weekend, uh, Daniel and Rachel. And say hi to uh, Dan from Warrington. I will do. Who will forever be known as Dan from I Warrington. I know, yeah. Um, I do call him that occasionally. <laughs> Hey, Dan from Warrington. Yeah. What's your point, Dan, from Warrington? <laughs> um, but brilliant. Really good to see you. Thank you so much. You. Very good Thank luck you with it all. Uh, you're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up next, the food fallout, the floods and bad weather spell a shortage for the summer and a dodgy summer sets to make matters worse. Don't go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker.
Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We were supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for Taking the Mic. It has variously been described as our proudest achievement, the jewel in our nation's crown, the envy of the world, and, if you believe Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, the one thing that makes most of us proud to be British. I'm talking, of course, about the NHS. But in 2024, even the Labour Party, which still speaks about our health service as if it were some kind of national religion, has started to criticise the way it's run and why it needs to be reformed. Ever since Covid, the NHS has been on its knees. Only this week we learned that at least one third of the workforce is off sick on any given week. It's been hobbled by strikes for the best part of the last year, but they've hardly made any difference to the efficiency and inefficiency in the system, which is now reaching critical mass. Only a few weeks ago in Bristol, we saw hundreds of people queuing up outside a new dental practice because they had all been unable to access a dentist in the area for years. It's clear that the NHS management have now brought the business to breaking point. Just as we heard that, 7.5 million people are now waiting for hospital treatment, and that's 300,000 more than this time last year, it's not going to get better anytime soon. Even Health Secretary Victoria Atkins admitted that people are waiting in pain and anguish. We absolutely understand that, she said. And these are mostly routine operations like hip replacements, hernia repairs and diagnostic scans like x-rays. Of course, the first stop to getting any of that kind of treatment is the GP surgery. Again this month, we learned that some GPs are making an absolute fortune. Average salaries now close to £120,000 a year. And yet, people can't get appointments. In Broccoli in South London yesterday, dozens of people formed a queue outside a doctor's surgery in the hopes of getting to see, you guessed it, an actual doctor. They got there at the crack of dawn complaining that telephone appointments were impossible to get 
as the line was constantly engaged. Anna Maria Callahan, one of the hopeful, said, I've got three appointments to make for me, my child and my elderly mum. Issues that should have been seen weeks ago that are now much worse than they were. It's an absolute shambles. A shambles indeed. When she got to the front of the queue, she was told there were no more slots that day and she'd have to come back tomorrow. The truth of the matter is, and you won't want to hear this anywhere else, there are millions more people in this country now than there were when the NHS decided how many GPs they would need to look after them. One in 20 people now have to wait a month for an appointment. Can anyone see the connection? Because I can. Moving on now, farmers are warning of a food production crisis as the UK suffers its 11th wettest year since records began in the early 1800s. With Storm Kathleen battering the country with heavy rain and strong winds over the last week. I'm joined now by the president of the Farmers Union, Tom Bradshaw. Tom, very good uh, uh, evening to you. Welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, it's difficult to, to see the effects of all of this rain sometimes when you live in somewhere like London. You know, you just hope when you go out, you've got an umbrella with you. Um, but how bad has it actually been uh, for your farmers? Well, like you say, it's been really extreme, the rainfall that we've had over the past six to nine months. For many, this started back in the summer when they were trying to harvest crops. But then we had Storm Babette back in mid-October, which really set the tone for the winter to follow. And we've just had flooding event after flooding event. We had Storm Hank in January. And it's just put incessant pressure on businesses over this period in time. And many haven't been able to plant their crops. And the crops that we did plant in the autumn uh, haven't thrived. And many have flooded out. And then now in the spring, we're at lambing time. And, and unfortunately, the rainfall events are putting huge pressure on those that are lambing outside at the moment. Uh, and there is you know, real pressure on those young lambs and there are higher mortality rates than, than we would normally see because of the rainfall events that we're having. Right. And, of course, we're told quite often that, uh, that people are finding prices going up everywhere, everywhere they go, whether it's prices in the supermarket and whether it's prices at the local market that they go to. Um, what sort of pressure is being put on um, farmers to keep those prices low when they're selling into the sort of supermarket business? You know, well, the volatility that was caused by the Ukrainian situation hasn't gone away. And the 2023 harvest was one of the most expensive we've ever grown. Uh, and yet the commodity markets have fallen away. But if you look at our milk sector um, or our horticultural sector, it's been incredibly challenging to pass these cost increases up the supply chain. And it's putting huge pressure on farming businesses uh, to be able to you know, continue to make a viable living. And so then we've had this weather and potato farmers, they're late, late planting the crop now. They had a very difficult harvesting period. And many of the confidence has been absolutely shattered. And they're now looking at it and thinking, what do I do going forward? You know, mm. can I afford to invest in my business? Can I afford to continue producing the food that I am so proud to produce? I mean, we've seen a lot of restaurants closing down. I've seen a lot of hospitality businesses not being able to sort of make ends meet any longer. Do you think that's going to be what we'll be seeing in the farming sort of region as well? Yeah, according to the DEFRA statistics, there's about 5,000 less farmers in business now than there was five years ago. And the pressures are greater than we've ever seen. And I think the real crux of this is that farmers and primary food producers are carrying all of the risk for the whole supply chain. And we really need to look at how we can share that risk through the supply chain. That's about long-term partnerships so that there really is a shared interest, a shared endeavour to make sure that we continue producing the country's food. We've got 70 million people here living on an island, and that's a wonderful opportunity for British agriculture. But we've got to make sure that we're not undercut by lower standard imports that, that and make it impossible to get the returns from the market that we need to reinvest in the country's food production for the future. Right. And I understand there's a government flooding recovery fund for those farmers who are, unfortunately, you know, um, affected by these floods. But it's not working as well as it should, I'm told. No, look, the, the headline is a farm recovery fund is very, very welcome. And clearly, we've been waiting to see the details since January. Unfortunately, when it was rolled out earlier this week, the, the farms that we expected to be eligible just simply were not included within the criteria that would make them eligible for, for the funding. So there have been changes announced tonight. We're still working through those changes to see how that helps the eligibility. They've re removed one critical criteria, which was a limit of only 150 metres from a named water course. And so that will make, make uh, sure that there are more members and more farmers across the country that are eligible, but there will still be many that are missing out. And we'll continue to look at the detail of this to see what further changes need to be made to make sure that those that have borne the brunt of this 
are able to recover some of their lost income and some of the costs that they're going to have to get their farms back to where they were previously. Right. And we saw some farmers in Westminster, didn't we, a few weeks back, who were sort of demonstrating against the government about all manner of things. We've seen it in Europe, we've seen it in the Netherlands, we've seen it in France as well. A lot of farmers upset at some of the targets that are being set, some of the net zero stuff that's happening around that. Um, what's the position with many farmers and why were they so angry they had to go to Westminster? With the pressure on farming businesses, we've had huge volatility, we've had a lot of inflation. Um, fairness in the supply chain is something that many don't believe is there. And they, we know, we, as I say, there's a huge amount of risk in producing the country's food. And they just don't believe that there is that shared endeavor with the supply chain. Mm. And then there's imports coming in that are produced using techniques and technologies which are illegal to use here. And that is, you know, we are not on a level playing field. And the NFU has always stood for fair trade. And fair trade and free trade are not the same thing. And at the moment, we are bringing in imports that we would not be able to produce in this country. Whether that be Italian eggs that don't that are coming in with a, a, a warning from the Food Standards Agency to make sure they're cooked properly, mm. because they cannot be guaranteed salmonella free. Whereas our eggs produced here, are, you know, we are, they've got the lion code on them. It means they are guaranteed salmonella free. And there's many instances like that where there's crop protection products being used, which we don't have access to here, and farmers are really feeling under the cost. So they've got a lot of things against them at the moment. I do believe that the administration in DEFRA is doing everything they can to work with us, but they really need to start demonstrating uh, that they have a plan for food production in, in this country and that they recognise just how serious these weather events of the last nine months have been and really look to put the support in place, which means our members have the confidence to invest in their businesses for the future. Sure. Great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Tom Bradshaw, the president of the National Farmers Union. Um, we're keeping an eye on the, uh, uh, on the markets to see exactly what prices go up, what prices go down. But shortages sometimes, but we seem to get through it. Tom, thanks very much indeed. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Uh, we go global in the next hour, looking at the fears of an Iran attack and from Kinsey Schofield on the death of O.J. Simpson. See you then. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, 
has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, online, and of course we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up... O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76. The American football star who was acquitted of murder passed away after a battle with cancer. Plus, an attack is imminent. President Joe Biden has promised Israel ironclad support amid fears that Tehran could launch reprisals for an attack that killed senior Iranians. Oh, and the Ginger Winger and Princess Pinocchio are to release two non-fiction series on Netflix, including cooking and gardening. Is there anything they won't do? Wasn't it just the other day that we were telling you in the Independent Republic about the ludicrously high number of fat cat salaries that were now being paid out in our cash-strapped councils up and down the land? Did we not warn you that increased council taxes and decreased services would be the order of the day for this year, 2024? Well, I'm sorry to say I told you so. You know how I hate doing that. But I told you so. And it's happening already. Faced with bankruptcy, ballooning debts and the increased cost of paying themselves a literal fortune, our town halls are doing what they do best aside from overpaying themselves, of course, you guessed it, they're slashing services. And this time, it is in a particularly cruel and nasty way. They're not getting rid of diversity officers or climate change coordinators. They're not losing traffic wardens or recycling officers. No, no, that would be too obvious and un-PC. No, they've decided to kill off some flower beds at war memorials and gardens of remembrance to save a few quid off their landscaping budgets. Absolutely despicable. Everyone knows why they're doing it. More shame about our military past than because they know it's the easiest target. Labour-led East Lothian Council has torn out flower beds surrounding a First World War memorial in Kirkenzie and replaced them with grass turf. Opposition councillors are blaming the SNP for refusing to part with sufficient funds. Presumably they're too busy reporting each other for hate crime every five minutes. But it's not just in Scotland this is happening. Rother Rother District Council has grassed over flower beds in Bex Hill Cemetery to save money, despite a local petition with hundreds of signatures on it. And the same thing is happening at Royal Sutton Coalfield, where planters and flower beds around two war memorials have been cancelled due to Birmingham City Council's bankruptcy problems. Joanna Marchong of the Taxpayers Alliance said, Residents are fed up with mean-spirited cuts taking away the small joys in life. Whilst councils undoubtedly need to cut back on spending, they should consider whether there are other areas with fat to trip. Tragically, it is becoming clear that the wokists have already taken captive most of the public services in this country, and isn't it pathetic that they can't find anywhere else to save money, aside from the, to punish those who fought and died for this country's freedom? It is utterly shameful. Now, later on in the show, we'll be bringing you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look at the Metro newspaper. Uh, and they go uh, with J.K. Rowling, whose uh, headline says, J.K. Rowling and the Goblet of Ire, which is not bad. I see what they did there. Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling has declared she can never forgive stars of her wizarding movies who cheered on transgendering children after a landmark NHS report criticised weak evidence that it worked and said young people had been let down. Uh, this story's going to run and run. She's basically saying she's got no forgiveness for the likes of Daniel Radcliffe, Emma Watson and Rupert Grint, all made very, very wealthy and very, very famous uh, by her own hand. And they seem to be entirely ungrateful uh, for that particular situation. We'll talk more about that when we get the panel back in. Uh, but let's talk about US President Joe Biden. He's promised Israel ironclad support amid fears that Iran could retaliate over a strike on its embassy in Damascus last week. Iran's supreme leader says the attack which killed several senior Iranian commanders was equivalent to an attack on Iranian territory and that Israel must be punished. Israel has not claimed responsibility but is widely considered to have been behind the strike. 
And it's being reported that intelligence services in the United States and other allied officials believe a significant attack by Iran is imminent and could come in the form of a direct missile or through a proxy like Hezbollah in Lebanon. Let's bring in now international security expert Will Geddes and former British Army commander Colonel Richard Kemp. Um, Richard, let me come to you first, if I may, just because um, you're obviously the man uh, in that sort of region. You're in that region quite a lot. Um, what's being said in Israel about this imminent attack? Do they believe it to be imminent? Do they believe that it will come from Lebanon? What are they saying? I'm, I'm actually in Israel now, and um, there's, there's a great deal of apprehension on the streets of the various cities of Israel uh, about the possibility of an attack. Because if, if there is an attack by Iran, either from Iran itself or from Lebanon, it could be more devastating than the, the huge number of rocket attacks they've seen against Israel so far in this war. Um, but, but either way, there, there could well be uh, an assault from Iran directly using ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, drones, and the same from its proxy Hezbollah in Lebanon. I think I would suggest if, if one of those two attacks does happen, and of course that's far from certain, then the more likely possibility would be from Lebanon, because I think Iran deeply fears the retaliation it would get onto its own soil, uh, which could help undermine the stability of the route. I think that's perhaps the more likely of the two, but also, of course, uh, Iran, through its proxies using the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, could also target embassies around the world, blowing up embassies as they have done in the past, Israeli embassies. Uh, but of course, Israel, is their embassies are well protected. They will be on, the, on guard against that, as they are here. The, the Israeli uh, Defence Force has a very capable uh, missile defence system. They've called up reservists in the last few days to man an additional series of uh, air defence systems. And the US also, I believe, has uh, offered uh, and will we'll make uh, make available its own uh, air missile defence systems in the region if if that is necessary. So I think I think it's it's a possibility. It's by no means certain. Israel's ready to um, to deal with it if it occurs, and of course to retaliate if that happens, which is a, another certainty. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, Will, let me come to you because you um, obviously cover international security in many different places and um, interesting there uh, what Colonel Richard Kemp was saying that, you know, there are so many targets now in the world, aren't there? Because, you know, they might decide, well, you know, how about the Israeli embassy in London? How about the Israeli embassy in Paris? How about the Israeli embassy uh, in another part of the world? You know, and, and the tentacles of Iran um, have reached this, this country before, haven't they? Yeah, they have. And I mean, I'd agree entirely with what Richard has been saying in terms of how Iran is not going to be, I would have thought, so um, overt in terms of any kind of retaliation. They have a long history of operating on a very covert level. Um, however, Israeli embassies around the world are incredibly well protected, probably more so than almost any other nation embassies than the United States, I'd say. So I think Iran would be more likely to use its proxies like Hezbollah. Hamas have been rendered to a certain degree inert, although they're obviously a fairly, fairly resilient opponent. But it's going to be Hezbollah and other elements that Iran has proxy financed and backed. Iran will never really break cover themselves. If they do, they know they're going to get the wrath of the United States. And I'm only pleased that, although it's very much down the line, that Biden has stepped forward and made such a bold statement in terms of his support for Israel. Yes, exactly. And, and Richard, let me ask you about that, because obviously until that moment, until Joe Biden came out and said that there would be a steadfast kind of defence of Israel and its right to, uh, uh, to retaliate or do whatever if Iran was to, to make a strike, um, you know, things were looking a bit iffy between the White House and, uh, and Jerusalem up until that moment, because we'd heard, of course, the calls for a ceasefire. Uh, we'd heard Cameron as well um, echoing sort of Joe Biden's calls that, you know, our support for Israel is not con unconditional and all of that. Has this kind of given a bit more sucker, if you like, to, to the Israeli government in terms of what they're doing? Well, I think, think so, but, but it's, I think Biden's stance is still quite iffy, of course. So far, he's been pretty strong, pretty resilient in the support he and forces have given to, and, and intelligence services have given to Israel since this war began, quite rightly, as has Britain, of course. 
But he has been very critical in recent weeks, particularly since the unfortunate uh, accidental killing of seven aid workers in Gaza. Um, that, that, I think, should be seen to an extent as being he's talking to the anti-Israel elements of the US electorate. Mm. Uh, obviously, one can't just sort of assume that he's going to be 100% supportive, but I think one ought to bear that in mind. Um, but, but it's also very dangerous for him to say that sort of even if it is for domestic political purposes, because, of course, it encourages Hamas to keep fighting. It encourages Iran to threaten Israel and even to attack Israel, to continue using its proxies, because um, but Biden's words, and as we've seen from, from David Cameron in the UK and elsewhere, uh, they, they give the impression that Israel is becoming increasingly isolated and that international community will pressurize Israel to stop fighting. And if Israel stops fighting, that's about the only ch chance that Hamas has got for survival, as Will rightly says, their last leg, they're still fighting, they are resilient, as he said, but th this sort of, these sort of words from the likes of Cameron and Biden and Blinken do give them hope and, and do encourage them to, to fight harder and to, and to, to refuse, for example, the um, the ceasefire terms that have been proposed in exchange for Israeli hostages uh, in Gaza. Absolutely. Will, uh, back to you. We've seen previously warnings from, um, from MI5 and MI6 in this country that there are some Iranian dissidents here um, who might become targets if, if things get hotter in the Middle East, if you like. Um, I presume we remain on pretty high alert here. We saw just the other night Champions League football matches were, were, were thought to be a target. Um, Lots of people seem to think that there will be some kind of terrorist attack somewhere soon. What are you hearing? Um, well, to be honest, I mean, I'm pretty much could, would concur with what you're saying, Mike. We're at the substantial level, which is kind of mid-range in the threat levels, which mm. means that a threat is likely, not highly likely, which is the next level up. And I would say that we should anticipate, I'm certainly forecasting, that I think we will be raising the threat level in the imminent period as to exactly when that will be based obviously on intelligence that comes in that will provide us with information as to whether it is a viable threat and there are viable threats that are coming through but i think the problem that we have is any country that is going to support israel will have accepted the fact that they will get potentially collateral damage as a result of it iran has financed certainly protests organizations individuals they're very insidious in how they operate, Mike. So, you know, the fact is Iran will operate in a very covert capacity. They, they won't be overt. And, you know, Richard, in terms of his position on the ground, he knows certainly better than me in what the position is there with the Israelis. But I would say everybody's a little bit sceptical about certainly Biden, about Cameron, as to whether, although they're coming up with the political rhetoric, are they going to actually back it up? That's the, that's the big question. Yeah. And finally, Richard, just back to you. Um, we saw that um, um, assassination, I suppose, if you want to call it that, of the three sons of one of the Hamas leaders. Um, there were lots of pictures of him looking not particularly, um, shall we say, bothered by the fact that three of his sons who were fighting for Hamas had been killed by uh, Israeli forces. Um, do they feel as if they're getting near the end of this in Israel? Well, I think it's an interesting... Uh, um incident because what were these three pretty senior and important members of the Hamas terrorist organization, the sons of Haniyeh, what were they doing above ground which where they were killed? That would suggest to me that a lot of the Hamas infrastructure underground has been destroyed by Israel. It, it, certainly Israel says it has destroyed a, a lot of it, obviously not all, but a lot of it has been destroyed, which which makes them even more vulnerable. So I think there will be a feeling among the Hamas leadership, whether it's Yahya Sinwar in Gaza or Ishmael Haniya in Qatar in his uh, six-star hotel or whatever is in there. Right. There will be a feeling that, that things are going to go badly soon. And and I think the um, the you know the, the reality is when Israel attacked Rafa, that's Hamas's last bastion. Obviously, it's not the end of Hamas completely, but it will will indicate the destruction of Hamas to a very large degree. And that's why it's so important that the world, the US, the UK, other countries 
back Israel as much as they possibly can to push on to the end. Let's not forget also that that's what Arab countries want. Most Arab countries in the region want Israel to destroy Hamas, and some of them have been actively helping Israel to do so. Yes. Well, we can all hope that it comes to an end uh, sooner rather than later. Colonel Richard Kemp, thank you very much indeed. Will, thanks very much indeed to you as well. Will Geddes there, um, security expert and consultant, uh, talking to us there about the latest situation with Iran. Now, O.J. Simpson, the former American football star who was acquitted of murder, has died at the age of 76 after battling cancer. His family confirmed the news on social media, saying he passed away on Wednesday. Uh, he was convicted and then later acquitted of killing his ex-wife and her friend, in 1994. Joining me now is historian and broadcaster Rafe Heidelmanku and also Kinsey Schofield, host of the To Die For daily podcast. Uh, Kinsey, welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Rafe, welcome back. We'll come on to uh, some royal Harry and Meghan news in a bit, but let's talk a little bit about OJ Simpson. I think Piers Morgan got it right when he tweeted out that um, so many people watched the trial of OJ Simpson, but even more people probably watched the inevitably mad car chase that started before all of that. I mean... Well, I was at university in North America at the time, and uh, I, I vividly recall watching that with my friends. I mean, looking back 30 years now, yeah. this, this was such a there. momentous event in yeah. social and cultural history in America, I think. And in many ways, it ushered in some of the modern age. Mm. This was reality TV for the first time. Yes. This car chase and the court case really introduced us to reality TV, just like the Gulf War had rolling news for mm. us for, for, with CNN. Yeah. And also in, in other ways too. I mean, it really, I remember during the trial, people were saying this is the trial of the century. I said, well, there was something called the Nuremberg trials yes. against Nazi war criminals. Right. Let's put this into perspective. But it was so important in actually revealing to us for the first time properly outside of America, the gulf between black America mm. and, the, and the rest of America. Yes. The 80% of black Americans thought he was innocent right. compared to uh, the similar number on the other side right. saying that he wasn't. And you really saw there the divide, not only just on race, but on, on wealth grounds as mm. well, where you saw somebody who had an extremely well-equipped defence team, yeah. you know, Johnny Cochran and Alan Dershowitz yeah. and Bob Shapiro. We've got the Kardashians it was, it was through also, that as well. Yeah, it was also sort of the beginning of the rock star lawyer type, wasn't it? Exactly. And you saw the injustice in the American system, whereby the, the, the under-resourced mm. prosecution simply couldn't, uh, couldn't face that sort of a defence team. And the fact that it was a predominantly black jury that yeah. acquitted him yes. only exacerbated the situation, further increased when it was a predominantly white jury yes. that found him civilly liable for about 30 million uh, pounds or so. And this all happened two years after the Rodney King attacks, uh, the riots in America in Los Angeles, when there was the first viral clip, mm. really, of the modern age, yes. when it went ahead when, when uh, American police were beating up a black man. And taken together, those two things, I think, really gave us a glimpse of the world we live in today, yeah. of the culture wars and the racial division yeah. and so forth. It, you could absolutely say that that's in a way when it started. Kinsey, let me come to you, because you may not remember the car chase, and you're probably not very old when that actually happened. I, I think I was in America at the same time, and I remember switching on the TV and just gasping kind of at, at the awe of what I was seeing. You know, helicopters up in the air, you know, following this car that was being chased by a load of police down a highway, thinking to myself, where on earth does he think he's going? He's on national television. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, an estimated 150 million people did watch the verdict of the O.J. Simpson trial, right. but... I, it was 95 million people that watched that car chase. And it's changed the way Los Angeles local news works today. If I'm scheduled to be on local news, they'll say, we'll see you at 5 p.m. unless there's a car chase. Because right. with little to no detail, the city of Los Angeles stops and covers a car chase based on this. Right. And there's actually a rumor, too, that David Hasselhoff has beef with O.J. Simpson because it was supposed to be his big American pay-per-view de debut. Right. And he was going to launch his American music career because he'd been so successful in Europe this same night that this happened and unfortunately no one tuned in for David Hasselhoff. Uh, Kurt, uh, it was um, uh, Katie, uh, Kate Hudson recently right. talked about how her stepfather is seen in the back, Kurt Russell is seen in the background of footage at OJ Simpson's house after he pulled up because they lived down the street and even a Hollywood star like Kurt Russell just was so curious and yeah. wanted to be in the mix. And is it still the case that the, 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 the world, or certainly the world in America, is split down the middle as to whether he killed his wife or not? No, no. Mark Lamont Hill, who is a, uh, a, a 
pretty liberal commentator, um, said today that O.J. Simpson killed two people, but he was acquitted because it was the right thing to do because of uh, it, it fixed some racial inequality here in the States. So I think that everybody here pretty much agrees that O.J. Simpson killed two individuals. Uh, I mean, and, and it was the shameless way that he went about the rest of his mm. life that I think, you know, can convinced a lot of people, whether it was his juiced reality television show, right. whether it was his hypothetical book, If I Did It. I mean, I think everybody pretty much agrees today that the man did it. Yes. Well, Extraordinary. Rafe, what do you make in, of that? In, in white America, they do. But what's yeah. telling is that even 30 years later, just about 52% of black Americans mm. now think he did it. Right. Um, so still, I mean, because you, you have to understand that the tribalism that was there. Yeah. It almost made me think about, you know, last week we had a poll about only one quarter yes. of UK Muslims mm. believe that Hamas committed uh, rape and murder in Israel. Yeah. And it's that sort of tribalism where people don't want to lose uh, face with right. their own community. And also, and, and you just think, you know, for, for black Americans, it was such a big blow because he was one of the few black icons who cr crossed the race barrier. Yeah. And you think about who were the last three to do that? Bill Cosby, yeah. Michael Jackson, yeah. and, and, uh, and uh, O.J. Okay. Simpson, mm. all for three different reasons, you know, had their comeuppance in their own way. But you can understand why there was so much investment yeah. in this man and why that community still to this day has difficulty accepting it. Yeah. And Kinsey, will it be an awkward sort of time again for America as people see that OJ has died? Um, they're talking about obviously everything once again. It was a particularly brutal murder. You know, nobody really remembers much of his football career anymore. And even his movie career was pretty sort of um, long and distant time away. And it wasn't exactly star stellar. I mean, he was in Towering Inferno and he was in some, you know, quite bad films. He wasn't really a great actor. But, but I mean, it'll be difficult to imagine him having a sort of star-studded funeral, for example. Well, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, they did tweet something only acknowledging the highlights of that 11 years in the NFL. But there's, you know, Fred Goldman came out today and said, I'm going to take the day to remember my son, Ronald Goldman, who didn't have the privilege of living as long as O.J. Simpson did. Caitlyn Jenner posting good riddance. I think for the most part, um, it's going to be hard to find anybody that relives his glory days. It's going to, we're all going to be pretty fixated on the more salacious parts of his life. Yes, I think so. Let's move on um, to our favourite couple, Harry and Meghan. Uh, they're in the news once more. Um, we've got breaking news here today that uh, Duchess of Sussex and Prince Harry will launch two non-fiction series on Netflix featuring cooking, gardening, and wait for it, my favourite of all, professional polo. Well, uh, cooking, gardening, and friendship is the description of Meghan Markle's show specifically. Friend, I thought you were saying, wait for it, friendship, because that was the big <laughs> kicker for me. Um, yeah, I want to stress that uh, it was yesterday that Prince William acknowledged Rachel Day on social media, and the, the tone there was Prince William breaks his silence after uh, the Princess of Wales' cancer diagnosis. I honestly, I want to tell you, I believe that that was to the Sussex's team permission to send their PR into high gear post Kate's cancer reveal. Um, because this is a PR push for Meghan Markle. When you share the article on Deadline, the headline is Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, launching two Netflix shows, no mention of Harry. If you look at Deadline's Facebook page, no mention of Harry in the description. Comments 90% negative, by the way. Uh, I think people <laughs> really dislike Meghan Markle and it must absolutely destroy her her, or we wouldn't see her fighting so hard to be relevant. But I believe that this is a real PR push uh, for Meghan Markle, even in the description of these shows, cooking, gardening, entertaining, and mm. friendship. Like, yeah. I, give me a barf bag. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, Rafe, uh, do you need any help with friendship uh, advice? Well, uh, I was just thinking, polo? it's a shame Harry's not going to be involved. They could do a reenactment of the Fanny Craddock cookery series, you know, <laughs> just have him half sozzled in the yes, background there. that's right. Maybe doing some growing some of his own herbs yes, in the gardens. Look, there's there. Harry doing some <laughs> juggling outside. <laughs> absolutely right. I mean, this is coming just after they launched, or, or she relaunched her new website, right? The, the sort of the, the cookery... Um, um, what was it called? Well, um, well, well, uh, that's right, with, American uh, Riviera, something or other. With with her Orchard. new with, with, yeah. her, with her new with her new lifestyle brand, but you know we, we've seen a, a pulling back of that because it, right. of course probably didn't seem to well, be the most tasteful wants... thing to do. Well, with the with the cancer diagnosis of the king and the and uh, yeah. the princess of Wales, it didn't seem like the right time yeah. for them to launch that. But obviously now apparently it is the right time for for her to do that. But of course. 
The problem now, of course, is that Prince Harry is left rudderless mm. because she's actually very good at lifestyle branding. She had taken everything else. She's got exactly what she wanted to get out of her relationship with Prince Harry. She's now a star. She can do what she wants to do. Yeah. But he's left still. He's got no, no, he's got no discernible skills. No. He's got no commercial abilities. No. He's left without any real role. That's why you're seeing him say, well, I wouldn't mind coming back and helping out in the hour of need the royal yes. family because the only thing he knows how to do is be a royal. That's sort of why they've created this mini American court in the US. Their website looks more regal. Mm. They're calling their children prince and princess. Mm. And they've got these charitable endeavors where he can go and cut some ribbons and read some pre-written speeches because that's really yeah. all that he knows how to do. Absolutely. And Kinsey, do you think that uh, at the Shea Montecito, uh, they've, been, they've been keenly watching Scoop, that new Netflix drama about, um, you know, Uncle Andrew and when he was questioned by Newsnight? I mean, I always love to remind people that this is Prince Harry's employer. This is Meghan Markle's employer reminding the world of one of the royal, the current royal family's lowest moments here with Scoop, with the last few seasons of The Crown. Uh, you know, Prince Harry is cashing checks from these people that do not hesitate to, you know, stab the royal family in the back time after time with some of the content they're creating. But for the record, I thought this was a pretty good movie and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed every yeah. second of it. I mean, I must say, <laughs> as a journalist, you know, you don't often watch things which are about journalism and say, actually, that was pretty well done. But I think it was pretty well done. And, and finally, what about the old... Um, uh, the visa problem and, you know, the, 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 uh, the spare uh, confessions that he took a load of drugs, Prince Harry, and he may have lied about yes. that, either in the book or on his visa application. What's, how's that all going? So right at this point in time, uh, you know, a federal judge here in the United States has Prince Harry's visa information sitting on his desk. I mean, he knows uh, by this point whether or not Prince Harry was given special privileges or whether Prince Harry lied uh, in his visa application. Um, I, I don't know. I think if he did lie, I think that that's very newsworthy. And, and I think that that's information that the American public would like to have. So perhaps the judge would make that public. Uh, I'm not I'm not necessarily sure, but Prince Harry seen, I believe it was yesterday in San Francisco with Mindy Kaling at a Better Up event, um, talking to people about how to deal with corporate stress, like that's something he's ever had to uh, experience <laughs> in his life. Uh, but I, I, I think you're both absolutely right. You, Prince Harry is is kind of left at a loss and Prince uh, Meghan Markle it, it gets to be the princess of America. Yeah, extraordinary stuff. Kinsey, great to see you as ever. Thank you very much indeed, Kinsey Schofield there. Ray, final word from you. Um, we're going to have yet another sort of six months of fun and games by the looks of it from the House of Montecito, aren't we? I know, no, nothing is over yet. And of course, we've got also the arrival next month on May the 8th, VE Day, 10th anniversary of Invictus, where oh, Prince yes. Harry will be coming over to St Paul's Cathedral. And we expect, you know, obviously there'll be a meeting with his father. And there's, there's talk about his father trying to perhaps broker peace with uh, the two brothers. I think that's for the birds. I think we're going to be we're a long way from oh, any yes. sort of a reconciliation mm. along those lines. But anyway, very pleased to see Prince Andrew was delighted to see, uh, to watch Scoop. I was told that he didn't, didn't even break a sweat watching it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, sure not, that's true. it's not a, it's not a five-star review that I think Netflix were expecting to get. But he seems to be quite happy about uh, the way he was portrayed mm. in that, which is quite interesting. It is, because he's portrayed as a rather boorish <laughs> character who doesn't have very much to say for himself. But there we are. Rafe, good to see you again. Thank you very much indeed, Rafe Hodel Mancou there. Uh, you're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Gray. My delightful panel are back after the break with the rest of today's news. Some updates from Julian Assange's case as well, plus some nonsensical fake Chinese stamps. Do not go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Quite right, too. It's that time again. 
to get the violins out. That's right, Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement. If you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham in one of the longest running news stories of all time. Julian Assange is back in the headlines after the first bit of progress since his extradition fears dating back to 2012. The Australian government has revealed that after all this time and so much effort wasted, the US federal government is considering dropping criminal charges against the WikiLeaks founder and that Mr Assange may be able to leave Belmarsh prison and return home to his native Australian. Australian? Australia, even. Uh, with me right now... The panel, they're back. <laughs> now, that was them all trying to salute at the same time, which clearly didn't work <laughs> very well. They got jealous. They got jealous. I, 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 Dowler, I mean, this is the thing, right? You give one of them a salute, yes. and then they all want it. They, they, Sam they, Dowler's here, Reem Bibirim as well, Andrew Eborn, uh, welcome back. I mean, wouldn't it be pathetic? And it would be a sort of typical ending of this Julian Assange farce yes. for it all just to be now forgotten, to sort of fall limply over the edge of a cliff, and you go, oh, well, off you go. Back, uh, they've dropped a charge in Sweden. They don't want him in America anymore. Just go back to Australia. Look, at, at the end of the day, yeah, like, I, I, saw a, I saw a movie the other day um, about the whistleblower in America who came out and said about how Trump, how, how the Russians had got involved in the Trump. It was a, it was a movie, Reality Man. Yes, that's that's right. yes. Yeah, and so, so I think whistleblowing is a really important thing, especially if, you know, especially if it you're, is. you're in a scenario. So, Hasn't even punished enough, is what I think. Well, his, I mean, his life has pretty much been ruined. You've got, as always, got to put it in perspective. It's 2010 yes, is yeah, what exactly. happened. All the way back to that. It's like he's been in prison <laughs> since then. To be and, and, and he's been in parts of embassies and so on and so forth. It's been a horrible time and people are coming out about sort of and that sort of stuff. But it, enough already. You need to turn around. But also, there's got to be a balance because we need to depend on whistleblowers when terrible yes. things happen. And he exposed corruption. Let's yep. be honest about this. With, with regard to the way in which Wiki, the WikiLeaks scandal occurred, he exposed corruption and we shouldn't be punishing people that expose mm. the truth. Mm. I suppose not, but I mean, the argument from the American government side was that he did put quite a few people's lives in danger and, at the time. And I mean, what he did, he didn't do particularly, um, I would say, no. discriminately. You know, he just yeah. dumped a whole bunch mm. of thousands and yeah. thousands of documents. Um, and actually, in some ways, maybe that was good because very few people could be bothered to go through them all. Yeah. You know, but there were people whose lives were certainly put in danger yeah. and possibly were even killed. Oh, no, that, you, have to, you, you have to put that into balance. You have, they'd have to make that yeah. case. But you have you to also have to imagine the mindset of someone who was there. You're, yeah. in a, you're in a scenario, you're in a massive conglomerate where you're so terrified and you think that something, something is wrong, it's mm. so wrong that you're prepared and he was to right. go to 
such lengths. And he was, and he but was he ended right. up being right. Yeah, exactly. but, but, but it's also important that you do have somebody who can hold the feet of those in the power mm. uh, to the fire. Of so course. What he exposed to the U- What he exposed to the US airstrikes in Baghdad, there were diplomatic cables and classified communication from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. But you're right, Mike, is there were too much. Mm. And some of the people's lives were put at risk. Yes. And I think whilst whistleblowing is absolutely right where there's corruption and wrongdoing, other things you need to be a bit more selective. And it was but just a dump. if governments were inherently corrupt, then we wouldn't need whistleblowers. And that's mm. the point. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, I blame the US government for putting those people at risk in the first place. Yeah, well, let's, let's, say we had like a, let's say we had a whistleblower from Putin's regime, for example. Yes. Of course, he would be on death's door instantly. I mean, he yeah. would move to America, whatever. Right. But like, this, this is the thing. Like, you know, we, he, this, uh, Assange is not at death's door. People are, he's not going to sure. be murdered. Because it's fight, it's fight. if he was murdered now, it would be ridiculous. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but if it was like, if it was, but because we are in a Western yeah. democracy, but, but also so therefore in, it was the right it, thing to do, but yeah. also a crime. And also, let's not forget, an awful lot of the delay in his kind of processing was partly down to him. Yes. He went yeah. and sought sort of the solace of the Ecuadorian. Of Pamela Anderson. Uh, yeah, and Pamela Anderson. <laughs> and and <laughs> the strangest <laughs> twist of all, really. That's, and that's, oh, a, win. that's, that's, a, that's a win for any straight man, to, well. surely. I used to say to the producers here, I said, the only reason I would ever do the Julian Assange story is if you get me. Pamela oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't and, care otherwise. Absolutely. But it was Chelsea <laughs> Manning. He got all the information from, from Chelsea Manning yeah. as well. And Chelsea Manning, remember, it was 2017, was released and pardoned by President Obama because originally Chelsea was, was uh, sentenced to 35 years in prison. Yeah. Mm. And looking at that sort they of They don't like, mess around in the US. No, it's, it's And huge. I think he's worried as well. He's going to try and get a pardon from Biden before Trump gets in. Because yes, Trump will because have Trump it over will, there. Yeah. No, but, yeah. no, but Trump already said, "Oh, I am WikiLeaks." He said that in one of his one of his speeches. He obviously, says a obviously because he doesn't know what he's talking about. Truth no. social. Like, Truth he, social. Yeah, he, was, he was like, "Oh, I am WikiLeaks." That's why he said he was, "I am Mr. Brexit" as yeah. well. And Trump, just, Trump is also quite possibly one of the most corrupt politicians. Yeah, exactly. Trump is a lovely like, man. Possibly. He speaks so highly quite, of you. Who do possibly. you look like? <laughs> he looks very good. I know what he's doing now. And that's an outrage for you to say that. And she's absolutely correct. He is, of course, one of the most corrupt politicians in the whole. Well, you say that, but. Yeah. You know, he hasn't been found guilty of anything corrupt. No, so, it, you know, 91 indictments, it. however. Yeah, and then, you know what an indictment is, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, it's not actually a conviction. Yeah. So. No. Once and you have to absolutely well, say that for legal reasons and other bits of Well, let's, yeah. let's, 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 talk, see what let's talk about smoking. You want to talk about smoking? Uh, I because did. Boris says that Rishi Sunak has gone mad. Um, is he right? <laughs> He's absolutely right. It's the one good thing that Boris Johnson has done since he <laughs> disgracefully left number 10. I think that the smoking ban is absolutely absurd. So effectively, the government have uh, put into Parliament the Tobacco and Vapes Bill, where the government are basically saying for one year every year, the smoking age is going to increase. Yeah. So that means it's a 14-year-old today bonkers. will never be able to legally buy tobacco products. Now, I think from my perspective, we've got to look at this within the wider society, the government has two choices. Either tobacco is provided by a taxed and regulated private sector, or it is provided by criminal gangs. There is no third option in which it's provided by nobody. Mm. And we've seen it in countries like South Africa and in Bhutan, where this does just fuel criminal activity. And the reason why I think it's so important is A, if you want to smoke, smoke. It's your right to do so. Do, do yes. what you want with your own body. We all know it's bad for us. Well, everybody's smoking dope everywhere you go. I mean, you well, can't exactly. get away from the smell of it. No, you but cannot... apparently that's OK. No, you're absolutely it's, right. It's you cannot... I, I've noticed this recently. You cannot You cannot escape it. You cannot escape the smell of weed. And, and no, I don't... And it's illegal. And I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with it. But, however, like... But it is if, meant to be illegal. Yeah, but, yeah exactly. It's, it's meant to be, to be but if... if if, for example, everybody stops smoking tomorrow, the, uh, the UK economy would collapse, obviously, because of the amount of tax. Like, yeah. if you go and buy, try and buy a packet of, like, 30 grams of pound, it's, it's, it's 22 people. people. 22 this people. Point. Smoking, 22 pounds, smoking rather. rates have declined in this country. Of course. Not by banning smoking, but by people switching to safer, healthier products like vaping. Mm. Yeah. Vaping is more than 95% less harmful. We saw that from Cancer Research UK, Public Health England, various different studies. Well, it, it, now, de- I think it depends on that. Sort of, some of those vapes are actually, they're, they're exploding people's faces. They're causing oh, all sorts of... Yeah, but that is a rare, no, that's no, a rare very thing. Those what was interesting, though, what, what are the what? chances of you riding an electric bike while vaping? <laughs> 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 Now, listen, um, that's enough about vaping. Let's yes. talk about the Chinese flooding the UK with fake stuff. Are awful, isn't it? But there are ways to spot them. Well, I don't them. know. How well, do you tell they're fake? They're, they're, you can tell they're fake. Now, the, the perforations are not right. right. If you, no, it's seriously right. If you have a look at it, the, the colouring is not quite right Where on, do you on get the stamps. Them anyway, though? Um, what happens, and some of the posters are 
have, have been supplied by people online with uh, with I mean, these stamps. Why are the post office buying stamps well, no, online? Because it's the little local post office person. Oh, they, they, they talk and, about and that sort of stuff. They lock them all up. And and it's, really, exactly. it's, really, <laughs> it's really not the time for the post office to have more well, 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 press. You know what I mean? And and also shock shock horror the the. The Chinese. Well, are, are they, they, the they say, fake, they say it's more fake, the, the the China, Have you ever been to Timu the, or uh, or Sheen? Yeah. It's fake everything. The, tr from, the trouble is this. The trouble is this. People are having to pay five quid to have their letters delivered now because people are using these fake stamps in good faith. They, they don't think yeah, they probably bought them online. Fair, I'm sorry, Chinese but you've got to be a bit, no. bit sick. You shouldn't be buying stamps yeah. online. You're right. You're, you're right. running a be post a office. Bit so that's, that's I mean, the warning. That's the warning. Sorry, this is Royal Mail we're talking about. Don't buy the stamps online. That's the warning. It's exactly right. <laughs> but they, honestly, they, the Royal Mail don't. Camera, the Royal Mail don't. Got that camera, see? The Royal Mail don't know their their um, stamps from their elbows. To be fair, I mean, they're, luckily they're I don't ever send anything by post. I mean, post. who does by stamps? But also, but who sends letters anymore? Snail, snail mail. Snail mail. Well, Carrier well, pigeons that you could use. Yeah, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you who does though, because yes. I found this is an insidious development. If you get a parking fine. Uh, yes. From any of the councils in London. They all send yes. The only way you can you can you can appeal it is by sending a letter. Yeah. You can't appeal it online. You well, appeal it. Um, wouldn't that be delicious? So though? So you send a letter. You have to send. I will have, to, I will have to contest you there because I I do get quite a few parking fines. I've, just, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've discussed it on your on your <laughs> show before, but it is. Fine. But they. But have it, you ever all, appealed them? I've appealed every single one of them. I've got maybe half. But off, you have to write a letter, though, don't you? Yeah, but you have. Or you can say it online, but then they will send you another letter. They will do it by by mail. Like it's like. It's like bills. Well, what, it's what, like council tax what, what, bills. What, what, I, what, I love, yes. what, what I love is that if you sent them a letter using one of the Moody stamps, they have to pay a fiver to receive it. <laughs> <laughs> so there will be glorious, <laughs> well, glorious that. justice on that set of basis. Now, you guys might not know about this story, but I've got to mention it to you. The Royal yes. Navy has got some new policies. Oh, I love that. Oh, we saw this. You, yeah. you, you don't run, need to swim. You don't need to be able to swim. I said, and you can join the fire brigade if you're scared of heights and you can and you can become and you can become a doctor, a surgeon if you faint when you see the sight of blood. Well, I, All I of these things are new I and it's a great policy. You're allowed to do any any kind of military service if, you if you're can't, afraid of if, water. No, if you can't yeah. swim. Not, yeah, I mean, I mean there used to be a 30-minute swim test. Yes. Day. Now, swimming for half an hour is quite good. It's yeah. quite hard to do, <laughs> yeah. I'd imagine. But, I mean, if you're on a boat and you're in the Royal Navy... Yes. And the boat sinks, and you can't swim. Yeah, well, you're a liability. Well, aren't you aren't putting you? everybody else? I mean, in we, we can laugh about it, but isn't it really, really upsetting yes. that they, these are the people that are supposed to be defending our country? Yeah, yeah. I have to like, say, I have to say that the the story does say that they um that they that they did abolish that. However, yes. you would get into phase one, and then you would, yeah. they would teach it, it, you exactly. they would teach you to swim in that yeah, phase, and then you would move, and tests. then you would move forward. They're, yeah. they're really worried about recruitment. So what they're saying is we're going to let more people in. Yeah, we're going to get more people in, but they have to be able to swim before they qualify. They get, only get to phase one, and what the, the, the objection so is, it's costing no money. longer need to take lessons in their own time before, before they apply. Up. Before yeah, they get, apply, you get it at work. They'll they'll teach you how to swim. But there's only before they what apply. What are your responsibilities at phase one? Are you at, are you actually what are you? What no, are you you're not. You're, you then get trained. So the, the the complaint is, it's going to cost lots of money to train them to swim. So basically, you're getting the non-swimmers uh, okay. later. That's how you There can't be that is. many. It's not going to be a drain on, on no. you know, society. I, I mean, also, we have only got about two ships. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like we need more reason to swim then. Yeah, anyway. if you can't, you can't, you can't. I, I've worked out what the problem is here. Guess who's in charge of the navy? Grant Shack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. my, my local MP. There you yeah. go. Did, who, who, sent, who sent us a little leaflet? Tory the, boy. He sent us a leaflet. Did a post the other day saying that even though yes. he is. He is the Minister for Defence. He still cares about us. Oh, he, so does. he does. Oh, you know? he does. So I sent him an email saying about the potholes and he did not reply. And, and he, he again used the Moody stamp, so you had to pay a fiver for that yeah, as well. Know, so <laughs> so you work on that basis. Um, now, it says here there's a film based on the classic board game Monopoly. I love it. It's preparing to pass go. Margot Robbie's production. How can you make a film about Monopoly? Very simple. And she's going to have huh? the plot. So I was, I was in Cannes, did I tell you that? Yeah, um, you we were, we were, <laughs> Tell we us were, again. We were talking about yeah, basically good parties, expanding... Oh, never mind about the all that. Did you go to any good parties? I, I, I had loads of parties. I was, I was, I was with Rick Astley last night. Were you, stay, were you, were you, you, were you staying in a, Were you staying in a tent on the beach with a refugee? I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't. But Margot Robbie expanding the brand, that's what it's all about. So they did Barbie, about a billion dollars, right. fantastic stuff. Her production company is now doing the rights to Monopoly. Oh, I'm uh, absolutely and they're going to on that sort of in basis. love with Margot Robbie. Right, I think Margot Robbie. She, she speaks very highly no, of you. She's, great, she's the most beautiful woman. She on is this incredible, planet. yeah. However, 
the problem for me is that yes. Barbie you can make something of because you yes. go, there's Ken, there's Barbie, make a silly film. Yes. How can you make something with Mr. Oh, very simple. No, because You've got it's, it's, a fi it's a, fi well, it's a fi it's financial, it's financial peril. You know, they've got they've got to have you know the, the, the top hat guy. The yes, the little dog. Yeah. Yeah. Margot Robbie is going to do what what she did for feminism for capitalism, and I'm all here for it. <laughs> well, I look forward to it, but it doesn't sound good to me. It doesn't sound like you're going to. I hope it's pro capitalist. I hope it's pro well, trade, sure it will pro be. business. Well, ha pro Hasbro, who are licensing the rights, they say it actually lends itself more to a story because you've got so many different characters involved. Well, it could be like a Wall Street. Sort of it could be like Absolutely. a Wall Street kind of story. Yeah, you've got a Monopoly show. It's all about teaching people about, yeah. teaching people about uh, well, property. And... For you. Do you know what the original Monopoly board actually was? Tell us. Come on, Andrew. I, I, re I reckon it's probably about 1910. I no, reckon. But what was it actually of? Which city? Because oh, oh, oh I don't know. It wasn't London, was no. it? Was Leeds. it New York? No. Where was it? Atlantic City. Atlantic City? Oh. Yes. For oh. some reason, it was Atlantic City. Now, of course, you can get all sorts of different forms of monopoly, which are actually quite ridiculous. You know, like they've got. There's, uh, a, really there's, a, there's, a, there's a RuPaul's Drag Race monopoly. Yeah, I'm sure the there is. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's, there is. A, there's yeah. a monopoly you can get without any money, but it's yeah. only cash. Yes. You know, it's socialist, you know, that is. Yeah, sort of socialist. I really, so my, my, my hope Dig for this. Central digital currency monopoly. <laughs> CBDC. I really Chinese hope. Bitcoin, Bitcoin, yeah. Monopoly. Yeah. Bitcoin monopoly. Bitcoin monopoly. Bitcoin monopoly. I really hope that this movie is a pro capitalist, pro entrepreneurship. Game and you know a lot. Of, you know it won't be. It'll be woke I know it won't hell, be. It's going to be woke. It'll be Margaret woke Robbie's monopoly. in it. I, I do love Margaret Robbie, but she is a bit of a, a lefty, wokey feminist. But but it was actually to, to your point. It was 120 years ago that it was first marketed. Left wing American feminist called Lizzie Maggie is what <laughs> in 1904 is what it did, and it was originally called the Landlord's Game. There you go, and that's why. And, and what oh, happened? So it was actually so, anti capitalist And the Great Depression is what suddenly made it go into monopoly. Of well, course. that was that, that's yeah, the whole thing though. When you pay monopoly with your family, I mean, it was always it was always arguments. The biggest there, fight. Because, because that's the whole thing, but you don't you don't necessarily you don't necessarily but you don't necessarily go to somewhere and then suddenly you're stuck with this massive bill like oh like that's not really like real life, is it? No, yeah, but exactly it's teaching right. children about money and how to take There's care of their it. money and investment. It's teaching people how to negotiate. Oh, I think it's the best yeah. My children will be paying Monopoly every time. Okay, well that's enough about Monopoly because Hike <laughs> of the Week returns tomorrow night at 7 p.m. only here on Talk TV. Here's a flavour of what you can expect. Yeah, I, I blame the parents. If you're Mr. Yeah. and Mrs. Rag and you yeah. call your son something that is shortened to Willie, oh, that's so he started off badly. So yeah. already we need to feel sorry for uh, William Rag, the yeah. member to take a quick look at. Right. And um, so he was caught up in a honey trap. Has he ever done and a private member's bill, do you think? He should keep his members yeah, private. Should. That would yeah. have solved this problem, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, so this honey trap is, it sounds more romantic than it is, because yeah. a honey trap, you imagine some sort of espionage thing, you right. make someone on Grindr, uh, the other person yeah. sent a, a room... It's not very phone. romantic, Grindr, I'm told. I've never checked, but I'll take yeah. your word for it. Mm. Um, mm. So the, the other person, this scammer, sent the rude picture, yeah. but William wasn't dragged up. He realises etiquette dictates that one should reciprocate a DP. Right. So he sends one back. So that's Plank of the Week coming tomorrow. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up after the break, we'll look at all the top stories from tomorrow's papers, plus a bit more climate hysteria once again emanating from the United Nations. Where else? Don't go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs>
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it was nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we was supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. The World of Woke. Now, how many times have we heard the clarion call? How long have we got to save the planet? Aren't we already in some kind of climate emergency? If you believe the Just Stop Oil doom mongers and the Greta Thunbergs of this world, you might be forgiven for thinking it's already too late. But, of course, they keep extending the deadline. Even though we're not doing enough to stop climate change and even though our net zero commitments aren't being met fast enough and despite being told that we've missed every ecological deadline there is, apparently there's still time. But wait, there's a new doom and gloom merchant to be heard from. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Simon Steele, a previously unheard of climate zealot who resides as the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC for short. That's a new one on me. He's come out and said, we only have two years left to save the world which in its way sounds even more dramatic than Ed Miliband once declaring rather pompously that we only had 24 hours to save the NHS. Of course, that was 10 years ago, back in 19, uh, 2014. Simple Simon, a former minister in Grenada, by contrast, is talking about the here and now. He made a speech at Chatham House in London in which he declared the next two years to be pivotal because of record-shattering heat and a race between countries to a new clean energy economy. The title of the speech was um, Two Years to Save the World. Simon was one of the key figures at the COP28 climate summit in Dubai, where the main achievement was to all agree there should be a COP29 in Baku, Azerbaijan, in November this year. Considering the worldwide alarm at all these events, you'd have thought they wouldn't have to keep having them. But there's nothing like a global jolly for all the politicians and green goblins to fly into on private jets once a year, is there? Apparently, it's still all our fault, of course, even though the UK has actually reduced emissions by 52.7% since 1990. Not good enough, say the climate zealots we are still going to miss our UN goal of a 68% cut by 2030. Simon says we saw record-breaking fires in Canada and Greece last year, no mention of them being started by arsonists, of course, and he reckons we had extreme heat waves baking Europe, North America and China. I thought it was quite nice last summer, actually. Next year, the COP30 party will be held in Brazil. I bet the climate loons can't wait to shake their booties on Copacabana Beach. By then, of course, it would have become too late to save anything. So just try and enjoy the rest of the week. The world of woke. Now, we haven't got a great deal of time left, guys, yeah. so we're going to have to look at uh, a couple of the papers. The Sun have got a very um, interesting front page headline. <laughs> They've got a picture of OJ Simpson with a headline that says, Good Ridden. Very subtle. But this yep. is coming from Caitlin Jenner, because one of the things that we were yes. talking about was that um, many of you, apart from Andrew, of course, will be too young to remember all this. Yes. But, but I mean, the Kardashians began yeah. in, uh, in the OJ Simpson. Yeah. And of course, Kylie Jenner. Um, and the whole Jenner family were on the other side 
of the uh, of the room because yeah. they were sort of on the side because they were friends of, of his ex-wife, That's mm. right. who he was accused of killing. So the whole sort of Kardashian Jenner thing was born. Uh, and it was during OJ Simpson. And it yeah. also made it incredibly popular. I mean, it, it meant that the story was was mm. completely blasted all over social media. Right. And with people that, generally speaking, wouldn't have been as interested no. in, in, a, in a double homicide like this or in, in, a, in a murder like a murder story like this. Well, there was no social and, media. No social media. About it was wall to wall well, coverage, wasn't it? Wall to wall from the car was, chase uh, to the other should, pieces. There's a um, um, there's a there's something called there's a program called uh, the People versus OJ Simpson. I've yes. seen it with um, Cuba Gooding Jr. Yes. As, yes. as OJ when Simpson. he plays him, yeah, and it's and it, and it is excellent. It's, it's so because it just shows you, you're right. It's like you know if if they had social media at the time, it would have it would have blown sure. up. But it was but just putting it in perspective. Was 1995, yeah. he was acquitted of murder, uh, but 2008, he was sentenced to 33 years in prison on an unrelated well, charge. Clearly, Caitlin to do still with still armed robbery armed and that robbery, sort of yeah. stuff. Caitlin still clearly holds so a, a grudge, uh, holds yeah. a grudge. Absolutely right. Speaking of holding a grudge, J.K. Rowling's holding one. Uh, <laughs> oh, great brilliant. headline. It's J.K. Rowling in the Goblet of Iron. Uh, that's hilarious. That All credit to I love a good pun. You I know, think she's pun absolutely right. Though, because Daniel Radcliffe, yeah. Emma Watson and Rupert Grint would be absolutely no one yes. without J.K. Oh, Rowling. Oh, I, well, I think not, it's despicable. That's, that's, absolutely no, despicable. that's not specifically true. They, they are not... That she, is, she was not the casting director she at created, Warner Brothers. No, yeah, no, but she, she, she absolutely she made cre them. She created the she characters, but she didn't cast them. So they don't really... Yeah, but without her writing... They don't owe her anything. No, I'm not having that. Without her writing the book... Yes. Never made that's, that's, that's the same as like saying that any, every so, Sam, every yeah, actor in Lord of the Rings, okay, Sam, let me, every let me actor in Lord of the Rings, thing, Sam, deserves like their their their, their career. So from just one JK, just one thing, Sam. Is Tolkien. it right that J.K. Rowling, as the creator, is banned? From attending some of these uh, Harry Potter things. She's not banned. No, but they, they wouldn't let her turn up because of no, that was obviously. No, no, she's that right? invited and she decided not to turn up herself. I, don't, I, like, I think the, the, oh, point, okay. the point of this story is that J.K. Rowling herself has effectively tried to insist that women's rights should trump any sort of notion of uh, uh, different types of feelings that different types of people feel. And her co her, 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 the stars that starred in Harry Potter haven't yeah. defended her, haven't supported her. And that's well, they've attacked her. Yeah, they've attacked her. So what J.K. What so, said is don't apologize to me jk rowling as in bowling that's how you pronounce the name but but, but don't apologize to me apologize to but the no women they're not but they're not, going, but they're not going to, they're not going to apologize to her because they don't because they disagree with her and, 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 and of course they're allowed they and they're allowed they to disagree with we, her. Disagree. we believe in we believe in free speech and we believe yeah, in freedom exactly. of expression they're, they're all able to have different opinions the point is the cast review that was published this week by uh, dr hillary cass she's she, this report effectively has showed that actually in the united kingdom the issues that we're facing Within, within the NHS are effectively that children that are being prescribed these hormone blockers, yep. children that are being medicalised, sterilised as children mm. are actually not being benefited. Not that the intended effect it, isn't It's there. very dangerous and ideology being, and work on that premise. They're being let down. Yep. And so J.K. Rowling... Rowling. You know, Rowling, coming here. So you can say anyway she wants I can say I uh, free speech. <laughs> Once again, this is the I independent can, Republic yeah, of <laughs> J.K. Rowling has actually come out and said, you know, They've, she's been defending human yeah, rights. Yeah, but, as, no, but as you and I, rights. as you and I spoke about in the yes. green room, the way she's gone about it is not necessarily. Yeah. And, and people and people are I welcome. Disagree with that. To, we, I people agree. are welcome to disagree with the fact that she that she that she yeah. took ten people. She took she took um, you know journalists. She took people that are completely innocent. Put conflated them with Somebody with like sexual with, sec Willoughby exactly, and with, with and sexual predators witness. and said, oh, they're all men, etc. I get why. But she again, was doing she's it. allowed to do that. Of course, she's yeah. allowed. Yeah. Of course, she's allowed to do that. But also, people like people like the people who've worked with her, like Daniel Radcliffe, etc., are allowed to say, no, we don't agree they with that. They can. But what has he done so since... Why should, uh, why should what's he done since Harry Potter? He's done loads of things. Quite a lot. No, absolutely <laughs> nothing that anybody cares about. Oh, Harry right. Potter <laughs> is what he knows. <laughs> is, you know, your taste. It's right, absolutely okay. true. Finally, uh, yes. one, for the, uh, one for the teenagers. Keir Starmer, Labour will hike UK defence spending amid threat from China and Russia. Yes, He's really he pushing will. the boat out now, isn't he, Keir Starmer? Well, well, that, He's gone from, you know, nuclear disarmament under old uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Uh, to building up our defences. No, and, and, and as always, two point five percent of GDP, which I think is really interesting, that Sunak, you know, has failed to do that themselves. Somehow, uh, Starmer seems to think he's going to find the money in the budget. Yeah. Yeah. My question is, where is this money going to come from? Yeah. I, I, I'm, there is I'm no very money supportive. tree. This is what they said, isn't well, it? I'm well, very... Rishi, Rishi Sunak's uh, pandemic money tree. No, yeah. but no, I yeah, agree. I completely agree. To spare. Yeah, but, but you know where that money came from, Sam? It came from money printing. Exactly. Yeah. That's why we saw double-digit inflation yeah. last yeah. year. Yeah. So I'd rather. Us not return to that to that kind of economic. He, he says now. Starmer says this is. He changes his mind every week. This week he says Starmer says defence is the number one issue for his government. Yes. I, mean, I next thought week it was it'll be something else. Flip, 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 fl
Let's just give the man a chance. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Well, I'd rather not, but I think we're going to have to. Um, that's all you've got from me tonight. You've been watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Thank you to all of you for arguing so well. Mike of the Week, back tomorrow night at 7 on Neil Talk TV. <laughs> Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth.